So I passed this out, or put copies out there for you, and I, I want, will be using it today. Um, I want to say first of all that there are some typos <laughs> as we go along, <laughs> and I'll try to make those. <coughs> but uh, I thought I would begin by just as I say, I wanted to share with you at the beginning of this class the sermon which I, which Janet and I read and then copies of which were made available to all of you. Uh, it was an interesting sermon and uh, years ago and by an Episcopal uh, pastor who died in 1961, so he's been gone a number of years. But it raised questions about Judas and Judas's motivations of, you know, in the in the pastor's imagination, what was what were the factors that were maybe contributing to Judas's betrayal, and a number of issues were raised: greed, uh, uh, maybe wanting to feel that he had a better way uh, than, than others, so betrayal was one way to trigger the uh, what he thought would be a better way for the kingdom to come. Um, and then last week we, we tried to look at the canonical gospels and decree the gospel of Judas a little bit uh, to see how the different gospel writers portrayed the event. And we noted that there were differences. And again, uh, chronologically speaking, Mark's gospel is the earliest. And uh, I was reading earlier this morning uh, Morgan Cross's book entitled Final Week which, by the way, if you don't have anything else to read in the week ahead, <laughs> uh, this would be a wonderful week, book to read during Holy Week because what the book is, it traces the events beginning with today, or what was Passover, up through the time of Easter, day by day. And it uses Mark's Gospel because the authors feel it is one, the earliest gospel, it is the earliest of the four gospels, and that Matthew and Luke were very dependent upon Mark's telling of the story, but they also 
added some things <coughs> to the story that Mark doesn't have, and then John still much later. And so one of the things we were trying to do last week was to just look at the differences in the way the story is told. And then at the end of the, toward the end of the class last week, we got into the Gnostic Gospel of Judas, which, you know, Mark, we're saying, maybe 60 years after the resurrection was when Mark's Gospel came into being. Then maybe it was by 110 years after the resurrection that John's Gospel came into being. And Matthew and Luke were in between. Well, in the Gospel of Judas, Number one, it wasn't written by Judas. And by the way, the others weren't written by the names that are attached to them either. But Judas's gospel, we didn't even know about until the 19, what, 70s or something like that. And then it was badly handled as a, as a document. It wasn't, wasn't well bound. <laughs> Uh, you know, it hadn't been published. It hadn't been distributed by Amazon. Um, so by the time responsible handlers of the Gospel of Judas, written in, Goth in Coptic, by the time people who knew how to read Gothic, Coptic got their hands on it, it was heavily fragmented. It was like a puzzle without several of the pieces there. <coughs> and in that gospel, the gospel of Judas, there is a reference to the fact that Jesus has a conversation with Judas, with only Judas. And the point of the conversation is, Judas, you are going to release my body because Gnosticism had this duality about it, body and spirit, body and spirit. And Jesus was, <clears throat> according to the Gospel of Judas, saying to Judas, if I betray you will free my body so that what is important, the spirit, is what will be around. Well, Gnosticism fell out of uh, favor with uh, <clears throat> male leaders of the church at about 200 or 300. And so the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Thomas and a whole lot of other Gospels were, were, were told to be this. No one would pay attention to these. And, uh, and in place what we're going to call these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these are the real Gospels. These are the ones that tell the story. These are the ones where you'll find the truth. I was reflecting on that this last week or so, and Bill, you would have an understanding of this that I don't have, maybe others. But it's peculiar to me that if you take other fields like physics or mathematics or uh, astronomy and you say, okay, Galileo or whoever you want to say said X, Y, Z. And for a long time, Galileo's X, Y, Z was the way it was. But other people came along. Other scientists came along. Other astronomers came along. Other physicists came along. So no longer XYZ is looked upon as the way it is because now there's this, 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 this. Why is it if we are able intellectually to absorb that way of thinking and the evolution of ideas in those fields, why is it we have not been able to accept changing nature of God's revelation, whether it be through the Gnostic Gospels or in other ways. 
And when I say in other ways, one of the books some of us have been reading and discussing in the past month is a very wonderful book entitled Holy Envy by Barbara Brown Taylor. And it's a story, her story, <coughs> of the fact she, those of you who don't know her, she too is an Episcopal minister who, after several years in a church, small church in Georgia, was asked to teach a course on the world's religions at a small college. And she began teaching this course. And this book, Holy Envy, is an account of her teaching experience, which involved taking students who were in the class, and as she said, about 97% of them were Christian, but as a part of the class on world religions, they would go to a mosque, or they would go to a temple, or they'd be involved with Hindus uh, or Jewish communities. And the whole learning experience was, what, what do we perceive as we visit these other religious settings about their understanding of the holy, their understanding of revelation and so on? And she talks about the Tibetan bowl and how there are different bowls, of different sizes, and the bowl, the sound that the bowl makes speaks to a different part of the body. Well, you may not agree with that. You may think, well, that's just a bunch of clanging. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I will have to say, quite frankly, that um, there's a kind of um, there's a kind of a message that comes to me that says, Gary, shut up and listen. And I have to say that's one of the most important messages I think I can give to you. We need more often to shut up and listen. Listen to the outpourings of the Spirit that come through the Muslim community, that come through the Jewish community, that come through the Hindu experience. Those other gatherings are, I believe, mediums through which the Spirit speaks to us. And our own understanding of what we understand to be the Spirit is enlarged, is made more wonderful, and so forth. Our, our willingness to say, ah, oh, there's more to the story than what I thought from my Sunday school days. There is more truth than what I was taught in my seminary days. There is more yet to be learned if I will only shut up and listen. So that's more of an introduction than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> so today I want to reflect on was Jesus, Judas forgiven? Are we forgiven? Are we able to forgive ourselves? Is there life on the other side of forgiveness? And um, I, I uh, had one lesson plan in mind for this third session until at the end of last week. And somebody raised a question, which was, what is grace? And I said, yeah, I kind of fumbled and said, mm -hmm. I'll answer that next week. <laughs> so part of this week has been an attempt to recover from that moment. And I've done it in, in, in the way in which grace came alive for me again some years ago. Uh, in about 1963, or four, 
The General Assembly of our denomination met in Des Moines, Iowa. At the time, I was in Oklahoma City, my first call out of seminary. And Dr. Campbell, who was my head of staff, had gone to General Assembly, came back, gave me a little book. He said, Gary, everybody's buying this book. I bought you a copy. I thought you might find it interesting. The next Monday, I leave for my vacation. I'm out here to the state of Washington, spend time at the cabin on Lake Wenatchee. I knew I had to preach the Sunday I got <coughs> back. So I thought, well, this is a good chance to do that. Get ready. And the book that was given to me was a book by another Episcopal bishop called John A.T. Robinson. And the little book was entitled, Honest to God. Mm -hmm. And I found it enormously refreshing and stimulating because people whom I had been required to read in order to pass tests in seminary, their writings came alive to me in a whole new way. Paul Killick, a theologian, Rudolf Bultmann, a New Testament theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, about whom we talked before. And particularly, it was Tillich's understanding of grace. So I've taken the liberty of including your papers an excerpt from a sermon that Tillich did which, by the way, I will say, if you're ever interested in reading what some theologian has to say, find their sermons. You know, don't spend time on the first, second, and third volume of their systematic theology, <laughs> which they wrote in some study and probably talked about in some classroom. Read what they had to stand in front of ordinary folk like you and me and say from a pulpit, and there it becomes more understandable. The same is true of Bultmann. If you want to read New Testament stuff, that's great. But if you want to know what Bultmann said, get his sermon. So this is from Tillich's sermon. And I apologize. I will, I'm watching the clock, and I'll try to get through this stuff. But I want to read it, and you can follow. Do we know what it means to be struck by grace? It does not mean that we suddenly believe that God exists or that Jesus is the Savior or that the Bible contains the truth. To believe that something is is almost contrary to the meaning of grace. Furthermore, grace does not mean simply that we're making progress in our moral self-control, in our fight against special faults, in our relationships to men and women in society. Moral progress may be a fruit of grace, but it is not grace itself, and it can even prevent us from receiving grace. For there is too often a graceless acceptance of Christian doctrines and a graceless battle against the structures of evil in our personalities, and such a graceful relation to God may lead us by necessity either to arrogance or to despair. Man, there's nothing that's worse than an arrogant preacher. <laughs> it would be better to refuse God and the Christ and the Bible than to accept them without grace. For if we accept without grace, we do so in a state of separation and can only succeed in deepening our separation. We cannot transform our lives unless we allow them to be transformed by that stroke of grace. It happens or it does not happen. And certainly, it does not happen if we try to force it upon ourselves. Just as it shall not happen, so long as we think in our self-complacency, we have no need of it. Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of a meaningless and empty life. It strikes us when we feel 
that our separation is deeper than usual because we have violated another life, a life which we loved or from which we were estranged. It strikes us when our disgust for our own being, our indifference, our weakness, our hostility, and our lack of direction and composure have been become intolerable to us. It strikes us when year after year, the longed for perfection of life does not appear, when the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, when, dis when despair destroys all joy and courage. Sometimes, at that moment, a, a moment of wave, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted. You are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, and name of which you do not know. You do not ask for the name now, perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now, perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything, do not perform anything, do not intend anything, simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before, and we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. In that moment, grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement, and nothing is demanded of this experience. No religious or moral or intellectual presupposition, nothing but acceptance. So, what is your reaction? Uh, it truly changes your perspective of who you are and what you're doing with your life. Yeah. It can even save your life. What? Yeah, it can save your life. You can perhaps be at a point where you think there's no more point in living. And then that, that voice will come and give you assurance. It gives you perspective on great pain and restlessness and, and distress. <coughs> sort of what it, you know, <laughs> implies. <laughs> My answer would be no. I, yeah, but then, but that sort of feels like Very it. healing, it would be healing. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how we can communicate that concept of grace as being more representative of the core of Christianity than more purest legalistic ways. You know, that's that's my big struggle is figuring out how how can the Christian church that isn't perceived in the general public, how can that Christian church join together or start sending this message, the message of grace? Because our world is certainly needing it. I think it I think it makes it very difficult to, to end up understanding Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and, and hearing that as some sort of exclusionary statement that the rest of you don't know what is really the way, the truth, and the life. And if you understand acceptance grace as acceptance, then these painful or other than painful experiences aren't limited to Christian people. All of us 
regardless who we are, what we believe, or don't believe, may from some time or another all of a sudden have that experience of, okay, let's move ahead. Let's move on. Let's not get stuck in our despair or in our pain. And yes, my partner is here to walk with me as I loved it for so many years. But I've got to get up and walk. I can't, I can't fall into a hole. And part of the grace is what gives us the strength to do that. Well, the next thing I want to deal with is the whole issue of forgiveness. The class was entitled Freedom and Forgiveness. And freedom came because of that quotation out of that sermon that I gave out the first Sunday, which, as you recall, says, the writer said, on Easter, it's still true to be the person God created you to be, the freedom you must have. The freedom you must have. To pray or not to pray, to follow or be led astray, and nothing, nothing in God's great love will violate the choice you make. Then the writer goes on to say, make wise the choice. That's true. Also in that sermon, it talks about repentance. And uh, I do think grace and repentance can be connected. I think part of getting beyond, particularly not the pain of the loss of someone, but getting beyond the torment of knowing that you've done something you shouldn't have done or getting beyond the pain that's related because somebody abused you is being able to turn yourself around, which is what repentance is about. That's what repentance means. Turn around and begin looking at things differently. That's part of grace, being able to look at things differently. Now, dear friend Gary Schwab, and I were great friends, but also great lovers of Frederick Beatner and his <laughs> writings. So, as I thought about the issue of forgiveness, I went back to one of Beatner's books, which I particularly like, which is entitled Telling Secrets. Here it is. And uh, I've read all of Beatner's, as far as I know, practically all of Beatner's writings. Presbyterian, by the way. So we can migrate from the Episcopal Church to the Presbyterian Church for a brief period of time. And <clears throat> Beatner's book here is autobiographical, as much of his writing is, as much of many people's writings are. A little story behind that book. Some years ago, and when I was in Tucson, a couple different times, I invited minister friends to come up to the state of Washington, to the cabin, to Lake Wenatchee, where we would spend time relaxing, reading and discussing books, hiking a bit, and so forth. We would have all really just determined ahead of time what books we were going to read and discuss. And on one occasion, the books we decided to read were Beatner's Telling Secrets. And it was the time when the book The Bridges of Madison County was very popular. And as you know, that book is about how some letters are found that the, I believe it was a daughter had never read before about their mother and some things that had gone on in her mother's <coughs> life. And it was sort of, oh, I see my mother differently. Well, ministers, 
I'll own this for myself. I can't speak for others. But my guess is that all of us have a bit of a struggle telling our secrets. And uh, I don't know if I need to go further in that, but I, I want to just say that's where I am. And I've often longed sometimes for a, a confessional booth where I could go and experience what I think the confessional booth was always intended to be, a place where you could say what needed to be said and somehow or another you were able to leave there and you had another chance. And so we come up to Washington, these guys and I, and we are reading Telling Secrets in Mad the Bridges of Madison County. And I, I, I say to them one day, you know, I gotta go down to Wenatchee and, and visit my aunt. She's probably in her mid to late 90s at this point. And, um, you know, you're welcome to stay here at the cabin and do whatever you want to do. Uh, but I'm going to drive down and just, we're going to visit for a little while, then I'll come back. But if you well, if you want to go, you're welcome to go, because, you know, they've never been to Leavenworth or Kashmir or Wenatchee. And so they no, we'd like to come. So we drive down to my aunt's place. She's living in this apartment. And we go in, and uh, she's out in the kitchen fixing us coffee, and I look down on the coffee table, and there is the bridges of Madison County. <laughs> now my aunt had been a school teacher, a single woman, all her life. And I saw that book and she came back in the room and I said, Aunt Allen, I said, have you been reading the bridges of Madison County? She looked at me and said, yes. And there are some secrets that are never to be told. <laughs> that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> there were no secrets, there are some secrets that are never to be told. Well, we listen as you will now to what Beekner says. I am my secrets, and you are your secrets. And our secrets are human secrets and are trusting each other enough to share them with each other has much to do with a secret of what it is to be human. If, as someone has said, we are as sick as our secrets, then to get well is to air those secrets, if only in our own hearts. The prayer cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. Ask God to, to air and cleanse us. And when our secrets are guilty secrets, we can start to make amends, to change what can be changed. We can start to heal. When they are sad and hurtful secrets, we can, in a way, honor the hurt by letting ourselves feel it as we never let ourselves feel it before. And then having felt it, by laying aside, we can start to take care of ourselves the way we take care of the people we love. Little by little, then we begin to be able to look at each other's faces and at our own faces in the mirror without the intervening shadows that unaired secrets cast. We begin to find a new source of life in what the 91st Psalm calls the secret place of the Most High, which dwells in all of us as the image of God. Is it true what Jesus believed this truth that he died for and lived for? Maybe the only way to know, finally, this side of falling off that precipice, ourselves, is to stop speaking and thinking and reading about it so much and to start watching and listening. It is only during the last few years that I have begun to discover something about what watching and listening involve. I'm talking about prayer. Prayer not as speaking to God, but prayer as being deeply silent, as watching and listening for God to speak. I have come to believe more and more that God also speaks through the fathomless quiet of the holy place within us all which is beyond the power of anything that happens to us 
to touch, although many things that happen to us block our access to it, make us forget that it even exists. I believe that this and quiet that I believe that this and quiet holy place in us is God's place, and that is what makes us as God's. If we choose to seek the silence of a holy place or to open ourselves to its seeking, I think there is no sure way than by keeping silent. God knows I'm no good at it, but I keep trying, and once or twice I've been lucky, graced, surrounded by the whiteness of snow, I have heard a stillness that encloses all sounds, still the way whiteness encloses all colors still, the way wordlessness encloses all words still. I have sensed the presence of a presence. I have felt a promise, promise. Well, before I say anything more, what's your reaction? Any comment? Back to your point of listening, it's been most of being quiet and looking. Let me say a word about figure. One of the secrets that he had to live with was a secret that began when he was a small child, a boy, a little boy. And one morning, he and his brother, little, two little guys, playing in the living room. And his father comes down, greets the little boys, says hello to them, so forth, and then goes down the basement and commits suicide. Well, that became a family secret. And without really being told you're not to talk about this, the message came through real clear. So these little boys had the experience of knowing their father had done something and he was no longer around, but we're not to talk about this. Beefner's journey of faith included a number of things along the way. One, he developed a drinking problem and he discovered through Alcoholics Anonymous what it was to hear other people tell their secrets and for him to begin to be able to open up and not just open up but to experience, as people do in that setting, okay, I've heard your story now, let's go on. And sometimes you have to tell that story more than once. You have to hear forgiveness more than once. You have to be touched by grace more than once. And you have to keep silent more than once. In Beaker's story, this comes, this comes out of this book that comes closer to the end of his writing career, and he had a wonderful writing career. But that business of forgiveness, are we able to forgive ourselves? And is our life on the other side of forgiveness? That's something we all have to somehow or another deal with. Now, I knew years ago when I was working with young people, I had these two couples who were adult supervisors. They were both married, I suppose now looking back, they were probably in their 30s or something like that. And they just had what seemed like blissful marriages. I mean, they were, they, they just, it seemed like everything was going right for them. <coughs> and I thought, 
Jesus, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because at the same time, I was going through hell. And I thought, what, what gives here? You know, and uh, so I just want to say that just for Pete, you're here. I think learning, and I still, you know, he says it right here. He says, you know, I keep trying. I keep trying. God knows I'm no good at it. But I keep trying. And once or twice, <laughs> I've been lucky. I've been graced. And I think that's, that's I, I can identify him with that. 110 percent. Now maybe you haven't had that experience. Now maybe something in your life was just always a bed of roses. God bless you. God bless you. But if there's any chance that there were thorns on the roses and you got stuck and it hurt, yeah. There is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. There is grace. So now we're coming to the end of our time together, and I'm going to return to Judas. And the question is, was Judas forgiven? Or did he just kind of go out and hang himself or spill his guts? And that was it. Well, as I said in the first class, I had this sermon where the entire sermon is devoted to Judas, and I had never read a sermon devoted to Judas. Well, let me tell you, I found another one. I found it in this book. And now we have a Lutheran minister. We've dealt with the Episcopalians, <laughs> and we've dealt with the Presbyterians. So now we're dealing with a live, working pastor of a church. Her name, maybe some of you have read, it, read her book, but her name is Nadia Bowles Weber. I dare say you wouldn't like her very much uh, because she uses language that we uh, associate with the gutter. And, uh, um, but she has organized a church in Denver, Colorado. And it's called the Church for Saints and Sinners. And she appeals to those who have had and want no part of a church that's so clean and so pristine and so therapeutic that they feel uncomfortable in it. <laughs> so she makes them in all of their grind feel comfortable. And she also <clears throat> is able to speak the gospel in wonderful ways. By the way, she doesn't encourage people to join her church. So if you and I showed up she probably would be courteous and listen, but she'd also probably say, you need to think twice before you, because we are who we are, and we find who we are to be acceptable, and you might find it difficult. So that's a choice you have to make. But she has a sermon in this book called The Confession of Judas. And I have chosen to share some of it with you. There was no Easter for Judas. There was no resurrection. There was no light shining which the darkness could not overcome. <clears throat> Judas never got to be filled with joy and disbelief at Pentecost like those in the upper room. He never got to stick his fingers in the wounds of God. He never got to eat sacramental broiled fish on a beach served to him by the resurrected Christ. 
Judas never experienced the defeat of sin and death revealed in the breaking of the bread. He chose death before seeing that death was done for our brother Judas. But we get to share something with Peter that Judas never got to experience. And it's the thing that could have made all the difference. In Judas's isolation, he never availed himself to the means of grace. Judas carried with him into that field the burden of not experiencing God's grace because he was removed from the community in which he could hear it. In Judas's ear, there was never placed a word of grace. And let me tell you, that's not something the sinner can create for him or herself. It's next to impossible in isolation to manufacture the beautiful, radical grace that flows from the heart of God, God's broken and blessed humanity. As human beings, there are many things we can create for ourselves. Entertainment, stories, pain, toothpaste, maybe even positive talk. But it is difficult to create this thing that frees us from the bondage of self. We cannot create for ourselves God's word of grace. We must tell it to each other. It's terribly inconvenient and oftentimes uncomfortable way for things to happen. Were we able to receive the word of God through pious, private devotion, through quiet, personal time with God, the Christian life would be far less messy. But as Paul tells us, faith comes through hearing, and hearing implies someone right there doing the telling. Now sometimes this comes in the form of someone reminding us of God's weirdly gracious nature, and sometimes it comes in the form of a spoken confession and absolution. But sometimes I believe that God's grace can come also through simple, imperfect, everyday human love. Maybe after, Jesus, after Judas messed up royally, nobody said to Judas, you are a sinner, <coughs> a great desperate sinner. Now come, as a sinner you are, to a God who loves you. How might that Christian community have been different if Judas had received forgiveness as the rest of them did. Again and again, Jesus had said they should preach forgiveness of sins in his name. Maybe Judas was destined to betray Jesus. Maybe it couldn't have gone down in any other way than it did. But maybe Judas chose death too soon. Maybe he didn't avail himself of the means of grace. And maybe his community never sought him out and offered it. Maybe Judas's community failed him. Relationship is a lot different than Beekner's take on being silent and listening for the word of God in silence. And I think it's in all of those aspects, but it's it's not one or the other. You say it's not one or the other. I don't think it's one or the other, but it seems like they're both coming at it from different places, you know, kind of shedding light on different ways mm -hmm. that God enters. Well, God's here. We enter our own silence or our own way of connecting with other people so that we can hear that, that grace and see that grace. Any comments? Well, she's talking to people that feel unaccepted in society. And she's trying to make them feel accepted that they have a taste of grace, too. And maybe their community did let them down. They're in a different situation what 
for a second chance. Sometimes I think that it may not be the community that, that failed, but the person's perception of the community. And I'm thinking of a friend of mine who suffered a, a very grievous thing. Her daughter was murdered when she was 15, the girl. And after that, my friend changed. And although we reached out to her constantly, she, was, she would not receive from us and it may be because of the night that she was murdered, she would, and she wanted to be able to pick up her daughter at the bus stop, and she was unable because of, of a physical um, problem that she had that night. So there may have been guilt or something, but I just want to say that sometimes it's people's perception of the community that is their reality and not the way the community always is. And I can understand where somebody who comes from that situation could also um, heavily weigh in on the community having failed. But that is not always the case. Mm -hmm. Well, are you supposed to go out and seek God? Or are you supposed to sit back and say, Ready on, baby. <laughs> what is our responsibility in all that? something that is so egregious. I can't forgive myself. Mm -hmm. So who else could? I mean, and, and, uh, and at that point, heaven only knows where God is. I mean, I'm, I'm in the closet with all the doors locked. Yeah. And it's a terrible, I mean, I, I, I am, have been in that place very recently. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes the person that you would like to say, I'm sorry, is not around to hear it. So then you gotta figure out how do I say that? How do I get, you know? So anyway, um, this last reading, to me underscored the importance of community. That's what I heard you ask. Yeah, that's what I heard you, you talking about. The nature of the community. Are we to sit back and relax? Too many from this is barely speaking and you may totally disagree with it. That won't bother me. But from my standpoint, too often, we in the Christian community, quote unquote, have certain ideas that people have to agree with, certain things they have to salute, certain beliefs that came out of some patriarchal past, some understanding of the Bible as the word of God, you name it. We have a whole list of things that if you're going to be a part of this church, okay, this is, this is the entrance exam. Well, there are a lot of people out there who were a part of it for a while and then something happened. And they, they just can't, they can't say yes to every one of the items in the entrance exam. I happen to know and care for and enjoy the relationship of Presbyterian ministers who today, if asked, could not say yes to the questions for ordination. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. 
whether it's the virgin birth. They certainly can't repeat the Nicene Creed. <laughs> so does that mean they have no gift to offer? No, they have lots to offer. Does that mean they're, they've been, they should go out and hang themselves? No. And so I want to say to you people who are a community where I have been nurtured, supported, loved, appreciated, now for some 20 years, and you, some of you for 40 years, some of you from the very beginning of the community, pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to what it means to be a people who can embrace those who are hurting. Find a place for them among you. Be a healer. Be a helper. Be a listener. Reach out. And I'm not talking about reaching out to people that aren't here. I'm talking about reaching out to people that are here. Okay? Probably I said more than I should have said. Okay. Well, again, my last question is, do you think Judas was forgiven? God forgave him. What? God forgave him. Well, I'll let you ponder on that. <laughs> the mantra, I, by, the way, by the way, those things I see, I see when I'm hiking. I always have to get some distance between me and the other hikers so I don't screw up their hiking. <laughs> but, uh, part of the spiritual journey that is mine and has been mine for the last 20 years is joining a hiking group and discovering things in this world around us that I would never have discovered had it not been I followed along behind Dick or whoever it was. And you stand and you look at a tree that's four, five, six hundred years old, and you think, what is this thing called a computer? Where were they when this <laughs> thing was <laughs> By the way, the morning paper, if you haven't read your Seattle Times this morning, there's an article about isolation. Hmm and read it, because it talks about the reality that today people are experiencing more isolation, <clears throat> and they're experiencing it because of the beloved iPhone, <laughs> where they are so engrossed in talking on their iPhone or listening that they have lost what experiences when we have eye contact, when we are touched or touch another by having a conversation, by learning to eat oatmeal without looking at what the message was overnight. <laughs> and the answer that in our article says is people are learning through 20 minutes of meditation which, by the way, is available on your iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> but they're learning acceptance, and they're learning that it enables them to make contact, maybe with one or two people during the week that they hadn't had contact with before. So, thank you. I love you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.